financial markets in turmoil. What are the root causes of the financial crisis? The dollar losing value. Heading for its biggest loss in nearly three decades. Will Social Security even be there? I don't know. Buy or rent? That's a very good question. Interest rates? I'm not so sure. Where do you put your money? I don't know. Welcome to the show that answers your questions. This is Follow the Money Weekly with your host, economist and best-selling author, here's Jerry Robinson. Welcome to you all around the world. Welcome to Follow the Money Radio. So grateful to have you here along for the ride. As you heard, my name is Jerry Robinson. I'm an economist and a trend trader here at followthemoney.com. I've been coaching people just like you on how to trade and invest in the market. We have so many different teachings and courses that we've done over the years, and our members just have constant access to our ongoing coaching and research. You can get all the information on our website, followthemoney.com. Now, I'm really excited about today's podcast because one of the things I was looking back through many of the teachings that we've done over the years and many of the podcasts that we've done, and I was surprised to see that we have not done a podcast anytime recently about options trading. Options trading is one of those things that can really kind of make you cross your eyes. And it's almost one of those things that if you have math phobia, you know, you can really kind of seize up. I remember that's how I was anyway. So I traded my very first stock in 1996, and I didn't trade my first option until 2002. Quite frankly, I was just a little intimidated by options. They didn't seem quite straightforward like buying a stock. I understood what buying a stock meant. You buy the stock, and then it goes up in price, and then you sell it. That made sense to me. But options were a bit more mystifying. They were a little confusing using to me and quite frankly I was very intimidated by them. So it took me about 5 or 6 years really to warm up to the idea of options and I traded my very first option back in 2002 and since that time I have found great value in the ability to be able to use options in different scenarios because options are really very versatile. You can use them for so many different reasons. You can use them to generate income. You can use them to speculate on future events. You can also use them for insurance, right? To protect your portfolio from downside risk. And so options are extremely powerful uh, and they're a wonderful tool to have in your tool bag as a trader or as an investor. And so on today's podcast, what I decided to do was to take an excerpt from our options trading course, which is available in our online store. It includes eight full-length video lessons. It's a total of five hours of online video courses. And what it does is it teaches you how to leverage the power of options and even how to get started step by step. It's a step by step process. We teach you not only what options are, all the basic concepts, but we also teach you strategies, three strategies, in fact, that we like to use here at Follow the Money. And so what I thought I would do today is give you or play for you an excerpt from the very first teaching in that options trading course. And that options trading course, by the way, is on sale. It's a deep discount this week in our online store. You can find that at followthemoney.com forward slash shop. And there you'll find our online uh, store. You'll find many different courses, swing trading course, position trading course, our options trading course. But the options trading course is uh, deeply discounted this week. And I wanted to share with you an excerpt from the very first hour of the options trading course where I cover and introduce several key options trading concepts, including calls and puts and several other topics. And so without further ado, I want to go ahead and just move right into that excerpt. And we'll just talk about the topic of options trading. I really hope you enjoy this excerpt from our options trading course. So sit back and get ready to learn. Welcome to this very first installment of our Options Trading University. And today's very first session is entitled, appropriately, An Introduction to Options. An Introduction to Options. You know, what I want to say 
about options uh, as we get started is that they are easy to learn. They're easy to learn if you approach them with the proper attitude. In addition to that, options are smart. They're actually very, very smart ways for traders to take advantage of movements in stocks because they require less outlay, they require less money on your part, and on top of that, they give you leverage, which means that you can boost the amount of return that you would make on a particular situation. I traded my first option in 2002. I traded my first stock in 1996, but I didn't fully grasp options until, you know, probably about six years later. I mean, I understood them, but I just didn't grasp them. I didn't, I didn't really take the bull by the horns and begin to use them until uh, about 2002. And I can tell you from my own personal experience that options can be a great way to generate income with less capital than is required for purchasing a commensurate amount of stock if you learn how to do it correctly. The problem is, at least from what I've discovered uh, over the last several years of coaching, uh, traders, especially new traders, is that many people don't know how to, uh, they don't understand how to use and trade options correctly. So what we're going to be sharing in the course of this options trading university is quite different, I think, than probably if you've ever attended another options trading school or any kind of uh, lessons that you've seen. We're going to focus on really what you need to know. We're not going to spend a lot of time focusing upon a lot of the extra and the fluff that is often accompanying uh, options training. And it's not that those things aren't important. Some of the things that we may pass over, we can come back to, but they're just not important for you to be able to begin trading some basic options. The longer that you trade the basic options, the more that you'll feel comfortable to move into the advanced uh, strategies. So with all that said, let's go ahead and dive into the introduction to options teaching today. Uh, and again, I want to welcome everybody, and I hope that uh, you're ready to learn because uh, this is going to be a really great series that we are launching now. Okay, so when we think about options, we want to realize that it's almost like learning another language. It's almost like learning another language. And this is good, but it's also not so good. This is because largely the financial space, the financial industry uh, really profits by keeping everything very opaque, uh, which really requires you to go to Wall Street and re rely upon Wall Street professionals. And we don't want to say anything negative about that because we, we think that, you know, people who are out there who are advisors are fantastic. You need a good financial advisor. You need somebody who's on your side to help you, uh, you know, in the day-to-day -day, uh, management of your money. Uh, you know, if that's something that, you know, that you're, that you're wanting, it's a fantastic thing. But oftentimes they make it very cumbersome and they use lots of big words and unnecessarily is my point. It's not that, you know, big, there's anything wrong with big words, but they don't have to use them. They use them oftentimes to obscure what is really quite simple and therefore it makes them more money uh, and it gives them an excuse for being. Uh, what we want to do here is empower you. We want to empower you to realize that you can learn these languages. You can learn the language of options and you can make money with options without having you know, to, uh, you know, to, it's not nearly as difficult as, say, learning, uh, you know, Chinese or learning Russian, but it is going to take a little bit of effort. So let's not uh, mince words here. I mean, it is important that you have a desire to learn if you're going to approach options. Absolutely, you must. And one thing that I can tell you for sure is that I am so glad that I learned how to trade stocks before I learned how to trade options. And it's very similar to what I find uh, as a guitar player. So whenever I'm not trading or whenever I'm not running businesses or whenever I'm not, you know, chasing my boys around the backyard, I like to pick up a guitar and play. I've been playing guitar since I was 15. So it's something that I really enjoy. It's a hobby for me. And one of the things I've noticed about playing guitar is I learned how to play guitar on an acoustic guitar. And for those of you who know the difference, there's an acoustic and there's an electric. And what I have noticed is that whenever I jam out with other individuals who play guitar, it's always fun to get together with other people and play guitar. And when I do, I'll notice oftentimes that people who play electric guitar, but not acoustic guitar, oftentimes they can't play the acoustic guitar as, as well as they can play the electric guitar. But someone who learns how to play on the acoustic, which is a tougher 
kind of guitar. The strings are harder on your fingers. It ends up leaving indentions. I remember learning how to play guitar uh, on the acoustic, and I had to, you know, I had terrible indentions, painful fingers. It takes a while to, to really get those calluses on your fingers. And for someone who plays electric, they have the same thing, but not nearly as bad. And so someone who learns electric guitar and then goes to the acoustic, it's tougher than someone who learns the acoustic guitar and goes to the electric. And it's the same way, I think, with trading. For someone who understands the stock market, who someone who actually has experienced trading stocks, then they're going to find options will, will be something that almost makes much more sense than someone who just comes at it from, you know, with no background in stocks at all. So my point is, is that uh, by having a background in trading stocks and by having the background that you have uh, here at Follow the Money of learning about stock trading, learning about charts, learning about how the market works, you're going to have a conceptual understanding that is going to make you, I believe, a better options trader than someone who doesn't have that same knowledge. So my point is, is the knowledge that you have now is going to make you a better options trader, just as someone who is an acoustic guitar player can pick up an electric guitar and play, uh, you know, with less, it's less cumbersome on him than someone who's, you know, never played an acoustic guitar before. And it really is the same way with trading. Now, why would you trade options? You, some of you may say, you know, I'm, I'm happy with trading stocks. I, I like to trade stocks. I like to trade ETFs. Why in the world would I want to trade options? They seem bizarre. Well, number one is for income, right? So let's look at these three primary reasons. Number one, you have income. And income, you know, is, is of course, very important. Uh, we're going to talk about a strategy uh, that is called selling covered calls, as we mentioned earlier, that will allow you to rent out your current stock holdings to someone else for an income. Just like you can purchase a house and then turn around and rent that house out for money and then let someone pay off your mortgage, right? That's pretty smart. Well, the same thing comes with your stock portfolio. As long as you have 100 shares of any particular stock that is optionable, then you can turn around and sell covered calls on those stocks and basically rent out the right to someone else to buy those shares if they so choose. And they pay you money while, while they're waiting to maybe take advantage of that, of that opportunity. So income is a, is a fantastic advantage of using options. Uh, the second is insurance. Insurance. Now, some investors and some traders use options to protect or hedge uh, their stock portfolio. So maybe you have a lot of a lot of money in stocks and you're really just kind of positioned in one direction, right? You don't have any, you're not selling anything short. You don't have any inverse protection. And so maybe you have a lot of money in the stock market and it's all pointing up, right? Your, your directional bias is up. You assume that everything is going to keep going up. And therefore, if things go down, then your entire portfolio could be at risk. Well, oftentimes people will use options uh, in, in such a way to protect on the downside and to give them, uh, you know, some income or not income, but actually to give them some capital gains in the event that the market begins to go down. So it's a, it's a form of hedging. You can certainly do that uh, with options. And thirdly, and probably the most, you know, the most uh, common amongst uh, new traders is the concept of speculation. For little money out of pocket, a trader or an investor can use options to gain outsized leverage to profit from an uptrend from a downtrend, or even from a sideways market. And so speculation, of course, is probably what many new traders are going to be thinking about when they come to the table when it comes to options and uh, buying and selling options. Now, options have actually been around for millennia. In fact, one of the very first recorded options uh, contracts in human history is found right within the pages of the Bible in the book of Genesis, when Jacob um, strikes a seven-year labor contract with Laban, who, uh, who happens to be the father of two, two women, uh, two daughters. And in exchange for a marriage agreement with one of his daughters, uh, Jacob agrees to work seven years, seven years of labor. And we know how the story turns out. If you've read that story before, you know, he ends up uh, kind of reneging on the deal. And then, of course, that requires Jacob to have another seven-year options contract to have the right to be able to marry the daughter that he originally wanted to marry. You know, there's another 
also a common uh, historical options contract that you can certainly learn about in history, and that is uh, by the man uh, Thales of Miletius. Now, Thales, uh, who lived in the 6th century BC, was a Greek mathematician, and he was a philosopher, in fact, considered one of the very first philosophers, and he used options to basically secure a low price for olive presses in Greece in advance of the harvest. He was an astronomer, and of course, as a philosopher, he looked at science, he looked at nature, and when he looked at astronomy, whenever he looked at the stars, he determined that there would be uh, you know, a good moment for him to take advantage of the olive presses. He believed there would be a bumper harvest, and in fact, it did turn out to be that way. So he actually purchases an option to secure a low price to use the olive presses in advance of the harvest, and then, of course, whenever the harvest is a big bumper crop, of course, Thales, you know, makes out uh, very well. So certainly options are not uh, new. They've been around for a long time. And uh, we can even go back in our own nation's history and find that option, the, the first options market in the U.S. began in May of 1972, when a group of 24 uh, stockbrokers and merchants signed what is known as the Buttonwood Agreement, which eventually evolved into the New York Stock Exchange. And the Buttonwood Tree is where they met. In fact, if you ever read a, uh, Economist magazine, they even have a uh, little section called Buttonwood, you know, as a, a throwback to this era, whenever options were just getting started. This, of course, eventually, as we, we said, it evolved into the New York Stock Exchange. And uh, all of these early market participants, they gathered in lower Manhattan underneath this Buttonwood Tree, which at the time was the tallest thing in the whole area. And so it was kind of the rallying point or the meeting point. And it was a very cumbersome thing because they literally had to put options contracts together on the spot and they had to find willing buyers and willing sellers. And it could take a long time just to put a contract together. Of course, since that time, the trading of options has become much more sophisticated and even regulated in recent decades. Now, let's really think about what options are here. Options are derivatives. They're derivatives. And a derivative should not be a word that scares you. It's a very simple word. It just simply means something is derived from something else. So if we think about, and we've used this illustration before, but if we're thinking about a derivative, uh, Robert Kiyosaki, who has come on our program many times over the years, a good friend of Follow the Money, he comes on the program and talks about different things. One time, uh, he explained a derivative this way. He said that an orange uh, is the derivative of what? Of an orange tree. So the orange tree is the bearer of the orange. The orange comes from the orange tree. It is a derivative. It is derived from the orange tree. Same way we could say that my book, Bankruptcy of Our Nation, right, is a derivative of me. I am who the book is derived from. So it is a derivative of me. And we could go on and on. Apples are derivatives of what? Apple trees, right? So we continue to think about derivatives and we say, okay, this is pretty simple. It's just something that is derived from something else. It is something that derives its value, not from its own intrinsic value, but rather from value of the underlying, right? So options are really derivatives, which are financial instruments that derive their value, not from their own intrinsic value, but rather from the value of the underlying. Now, what does that mean? Well, in the case of options, the underlying could be really anything. You could have an option on a stock, so that could be the underlying, or you could have an option on an ETF, that could be the underlying, or you could have an option on a commodity, or you could have an option on an interest rate, or you could have an option, I mean, literally on and on and on. You could have an option on bonds. You could have an option on debt. You, you know, literally, you could have an option on anything. Uh, that there's two parties willing to do it. So in that case, options then are, their value is derived from the intrinsic value or the real value from the underlying asset that the option is based upon. Plus, options are basically time-based financial instruments. So the time that you have to exercise that option, it also provides the option with value. So options are uh, derivatives. 
Now, let's just really quickly look at the difference between stocks and options. There's several differences here, and let's really clarify these in our minds so we fully understand the difference. Okay, so ownership is the very first difference. The stock that you purchase represents ownership in a company. Everybody gets that, right? You buy a stock in Microsoft, now you are part owner of the common shares of Microsoft. But when you buy a stock option, the stock option represents the choice to buy or sell the stock, right? So it's really, you don't really own the stock, you instead own an option to buy or sell the stock, right? Very different, very different. Okay, secondly, when you buy a stock, you are a shareholder, right? Usually a common shareholder, unless you buy preferred shares. And as a common shareholder, you receive a few things. You receive voting rights, right? You also receive a share of dividends if they are paid by the company. But as a stock option holder, stock option holders receive no dividends. So if the company has, you know, pays out big dividends, you're not going to receive those as an option uh, holder. And also, you don't get to participate in any voting rights. And why is that the case? Because you do not own the stock. You own an option to buy or sell the stock. And that is a very different thing. Also, there is this thing known as expiration, which is very different from a regular stock. So the stock of a company does not, you know, doesn't expire unless the company itself goes out of business. So this makes the stock an asset. So if I buy a share of Microsoft, then that is not going to expire unless the company goes out of business. So I'll always own that share of stock as long as Microsoft is around. But when I buy a stock option, the option is designed, it's time-based. And so it is designed to expire at a date in the future, which we call the expiration date. And after that expiration date, the option holder has no more rights, right? He has no more rights. He can't buy or sell the stock based upon that option anymore. So the option literally can expire. And when it expires, it's worthless. It's entirely worthless. So therefore, it's very important to remember that when you buy a stock option, the clock starts if you're a buyer, right? If you're a buyer, the clock is working against you. It's like that old Rolling Stones song, time is on your side. Well, that's not the case when you're an options buyer. When you're an options seller, if you're selling options, which I'm really going to strongly uh, promote in this in this uh, series of lectures, I think it's a wonderful way to approach options is to view them uh, to view options as a seller of options, then uh, time is on your side. It's a wonderful thing, right? But when you're a buyer, it's tick tock, tick tock, winding down, and eventually your option will be worthless. So you're up against the clock when you're a stock option buyer or holder. When you are selling an option, time is on your side. We'll get into more about that later. And remember, at any point, I know many of you are probably brand new to this, uh, to options. Don't worry, because we're going we're gonna to fill in all the gaps as we go. Okay, another one is valuation. Stock prices are based primarily on what? Well, they're based upon earnings, right? They're based upon the current sentiment about the stock and the market, supply, demand. I mean, all of those basic things, all the fundamentals. But a stock option is based to a large degree on the price of the underlying stock and the time until expiration of that option. So it's different. It's not the same as, you know, buying a stock, of course. Now, whenever you buy a stock, uh, you can take that stock and you can sell it to another investor at any point, right? So you can, you can buy that share of Microsoft and 10 years from now, assuming Microsoft is still in business, you can sell that share of stock to someone else, right? It's yours. You have complete ownership over it. But when you buy an option, you cannot trade it past the expiration date. We keep running into this, this over and over again. It's so important that you understand the expiration date because we're going to really get into that deeper uh, as we continue on with uh, this series. So the option cannot be traded after the expiration date. It literally is going to run out. It's like it's almost like a if you if you had a uh, hourglass and you turn it over and the sand begins to go down. I mean, at one point it's going to run out. That's how long you own that option. It's a wasting asset. And then there are risks. Uh, if you buy that share of Microsoft and Microsoft goes out of business, then and you don't sell the, the shares before it happens, then you could lose everything, right? You could lose everything that you put into that stock. So everything that you put into it is gone. And so, you know, that could be pretty devastating if you have a lot of money in a particular stock and then something happens. Uh, 
as an options buyer holder, and we call them the same thing, if you buy an option, you're an option holder, then you risk the entire amount of the premium that you pay. Okay, so you're not actually buying the stock, remember, whenever, because if you bought the stock, then you would have voting rights and you would have the dividends and all of this. But as an option buyer, you're paying something else. You're not, you're not buying the stock. You're paying a premium to give you the right to buy the stock or to sell the stock. Right. So it's very, very different. And when you're and we'll talk about this a little bit more uh, as we go forward. But it's very, very important to understand that there are different risks involved. And it all depends how you structure the option that determines the outcome of the risk. So another way we can think about this is we can say that stocks are one dimensional, one dimensional and options are three dimensional. And what we mean by this is simply this. Stocks have, they're one dimensional. And the fact that the only thing you're concerned about, the only thing that really matters is the direction of the stock. If you buy Microsoft, and again, I'm using them over and over as an illustration here, but if you buy Microsoft for $25 a share, let's just say it's $25 in this, in this example, you buy $25 a share of Microsoft. Okay. So you buy the stock and now all you have to do is be right about one thing. That's it. One thing. You've just got to know, is this stock going up or down? Because if you buy it and it goes down, well, then you were wrong, right? And that, that was your one dement, that was your one, the only thing you had to be right about was the direction of it. That's it. That's all you had to do. But, uh, you know, maybe it goes up, maybe it goes down. That's all you got to worry about. But options are three dimensional, which means that you not only have to be right about the direction of the stock, right? You also have to be right about the time of the stock, right? And you also have to be right about the price that it will reach during that time, right? So options require you to be right, not only about direction, but you have to be right about direction and specifically the rough price it will be during that direction within a particular period of time, a specified period of time that you determine at the outset. So you technically have to be right about quite a bit, right? Now this, of course, these are the three things that you would need to have on your side. You would have to have all of these things working for you as an options buyer, as an options buyer. And again, I want to stress to you that making money uh, as an options buyer is much tougher than making money as an options seller. So I want you to see this common theme as we go through here. I'm going to be constantly biased to one side. I'm going to constantly be telling you that options sellers or option writers, they're the same thing. You can either write an option or you can sell an option. It's the exact same thing, right? It's the same word. It's the same thing. It's the same concept. You're either an option writer or an option seller, same thing. Uh, you are better off because you don't have to be right about so many things. You certainly uh, don't have to be right about all, all of these things. And so we'll see as we go forward why being an option seller is one of the smartest things that you can do if you're going to get into the world of options. Now, believe it or not, there's only two kinds of options. Now, there's a million different strategies. And if you start looking at all the strategies, you can get paralysis by analysis. And you think, oh my goodness, there's just, it's just too complicated. I don't understand strangles and straddles and iron condors and all of these different kinds of strategies. Well, a, don't worry about those. I can tell you from experience that if you start focusing upon that uh, early, you're going to get sidetracked and you're going to end up not really focusing upon what you need to learn. Don't worry about strategy right now. Worry about learning the basics. And there are two types of options. That's it. That's it. Calls and puts. Calls and puts. Two different kinds. That's it. So you can either buy a call or you can buy a put, right? Or you could do a couple of other actions. So there's really four actions you can take. You can buy a call, right? You can buy a put or what? You could sell a call or you could sell a put. So there are really four actions that all options uh, traders can really take. And we, when we say options traders, it really is options trading. Is It's not options investing. Nobody invests in options because options, again, are these time-based things. So you're not really investing. You're really trading. You're trading options, right? Or you're writing options, you're selling options. But as you can see here, there's really only four ways to do it. Now we can take these and we can do one or we can do two, right? It all depends on what our strategy is. But if we want to buy a call, well, then that's all we do. Or we might want to get fancy 
and maybe buy a call and buy a put. We might want to buy a call and sell a put. You know, all, all different kind. You can literally just kind of all the different strategies or combinations of these four actions. And that's really what I want to get across is that it's going to seem as you look at all the different strategies, like, oh my gosh, there's so many different ways to do this. But in reality, it's not that complicated. It's just, it's just literally buying a call option, buying a put option, selling a call option and selling a put option. Okay. So let's talk about these real quickly. Buying a call option. That's number one. Well, what is that? What is that? Well, buying a call option is basically this. When you buy a call option, you are basically making an agreement that gives you as the buyer the right to buy a stock or an ETF or whatever else the underlying might be. It could be a commodity. It could be a currency. It could be a interest rate. I mean, it could be any kind of thing that you could think of, but it gives you the right to buy. Now, remember, as you're buying a call option, you get the right to buy. You get the right to buy a stock or an ETF or whatever at a predetermined price that you decide for a limited period of time, which you decide. So you are the decider here. All of these, you, but you have to be right about all of these things in order to really make any money. So when you buy a call option, you are given the right, you're buying a right. You're not buying a stock. You're not buying a stock that pays dividends. You're not buying a stock that gives you voting rights. You're buying a right. You're buying a right to buy a stock at a predetermined price for a limited period of time. Maybe you want to buy a boat. Maybe you really want to buy a boat and you're going out to the, to the uh, different stores around town and you're looking at all the different boats and you're saying, gosh, these boats cost, the one I want cost eighteen to $20,000. And then you find out your neighbor has a boat and it's kind of like the one you wanted and you didn't realize that he had one just like you wanted and he's willing to sell it for $8,000. Well, you were planning on financing the boat, so you didn't have $8,000 laying around, but you could probably get it in about 30 days. And so you go to your neighbor and you say, listen, I really want that boat because I'm looking at them brand new and they're, you know, they cost eighteen, twenty thousand dollars and you're selling yours for eight thousand. That's a great deal, but I don't have the money yet. Would you take five hundred dollars right now and take that thing off the market and give me 30 days to, to scrounge up eight thousand dollars and I'll buy this boat. Now, listen, if I can't come up with the money in 30 days, then I'll relinquish my right to the boat and you can then do whatever you want with the boat. You can sell it to somebody else or whatever. But for 30 days, would you give me the option, the option of doing this? the right to do this? And he may say yes. And so he takes your $500 and then you now have 30 days to scrounge together $8,000. A couple of things are going to happen uh, that potentially could happen. Number one, you come up with the money and then you go give the money to the neighbor and he gets your original $500 that gave you the right to do this. And then you also give him another $8,000 to buy the boat. So in the end, he has a win-win situation because he got $8,500 for his $8,000 boat, but he, of course he had to wait 30 days. And you uh, got an $8,000 boat instead of paying $18,000 right, for a similar boat. And so everybody wins in that kind of situation. But uh, I think that's a really good way to think about it. And there's all little different things that can happen there. We won't go into every single little detail, but you can imagine at some point you might find somebody who you might want to sell that right to, right? You might turn around. And that's exactly what happens a lot of times in uh, uh, wholesaling houses. For those of you who deal with real estate, we can take the same exact example. You may find a house that's for, you know, for sale and you then wrap up kind of an option on that house. You say, I I want the right to buy this house for this amount of money. And then you turn around and you go find some buyer that's willing to pay a little more. And then you basically make the deal happen and you keep you know, the spread and you paid a little money to, for the right to do that. So anyway, long story short, options are very, very common. They're, they're, they're so unbelievably common. So don't be, um, don't be alarmed or afraid of, uh, of these very simple but yet sophisticated financial instruments. Okay, so we could buy a call option. Now, what about buying a put option? What's that? Well, basically, this is an agreement that gives the buyer the right to sell. To sell. See, the only only word that's different here is sell. Put, when you buy a put, you are what? You are bearish on the underlying. When you buy a call, you're bullish on the underlying, right? So you buy a put option, and it, basically this is an agreement that gives the buyer the right to sell a stock or an ETF or whatever, whatever the underlying is, at a predetermined price for a limited period of time, right? So you get a right. Now, option buyers enjoy limited loss potential and unlimited potential gains. 
Now, that sounds really good, doesn't it? You, see, you hear that and you say, well, gosh, that's a wonderful thing. You have limited loss potential. The limited loss potential, of course, is your outlay. It's the cost of the premium. It's whenever you buy the call option or you buy the put option, you're going to pay a premium. The premium, where does the premium go to? Premium goes to the option seller. So the seller is the one who receives the premium from the buyer, right? So the buyer pays the premium to buy this option and he pays it to the seller of the option, right? So the seller is the one who gets cash. The seller really, that's really all he ever gets is cash. The seller gets that upfront premium at the beginning, right? And so therefore his potential gains are limited. His potential gains are limited to whatever the premium is, but his loss potential as a seller is larger than the option buyer because the option buyer, his potential loss is limited to the amount he puts out for the premium, but his potential gains are unlimited because the price of the stock or the ETF or whatever could theoretically go up as high as you can imagine. That sky's the limit. So anything could happen. So he has unlimited potential gains. Now, all options have expiration dates. Very, very important. All options have expiration dates. They are time-based. All contracts that are issued you know, as an option, are they all cease trading on the third Friday of the month, of every month, at 4 p.m. Eastern time. So any option that is scheduled to expire in October will cease trading and will expire on the third Friday of October at 4 p.m. Eastern time. And so this, of course, creates time pressure and it gives them uh, added risk. It gives them added risk. Options trade uh, during the open hours of the underlying. So if you're wanting to trade an option, well, you'll trade it at the same exact time that you would trade the stock whenever it's open for business. So, you know, during the regular market hours are when options uh, trade. Now, when you, when you were looking at one options contract, you should realize that one options contract controls 100 shares of the underlying. So if I buy one call option on Microsoft, that doesn't give me control of one share of Microsoft. It gives me control of 100 shares of Microsoft. So if I bought 10 options contracts, then I would control how many? A thousand shares of the underlying. So one options contract controls 100 shares of the underlying. And that's why as an option seller, when we get to the topic of uh, selling covered calls, you have to have at least 100 shares because you can't make an options contract without at least 100 shares. If you have 200 shares, then you could theoretically sell two options contracts on those shares. So let's say it this way. Option buyers have rights, right? And option sellers have obligations. The option buyer has no obligation. He only has right. He can choose to exercise that right anytime prior to the expiration date. The option seller receives the premium from the option buyer and gives that buyer the right. And if that buyer decides to exercise his right, then the option seller has what? He has an obligation to honor that right that he has given to the buyer for a, for a fee. So the seller has to uh, do what he said he would do, uh, whatever the contract happens to be, whether it's a you know somebody bought a put or somebody bought a uh, call, the option seller has to be ready to meet his obligation because he received money. And by the way, don't worry, that the option seller won't keep his obligation because that's already taken care of. Option sellers really, they have obligations, but those obligations are not really, they're not really a choice. They are, once you enter the contract, you're in the contract and you know, you will, you will keep your obligation uh, as an option seller. Otherwise there would not be any trust in the options market. And so, uh, you know, due to all of the sophistication in the options market, they have certainly ensured that both sides are operating honestly. Hi friends, it's Jerry Robinson here from Follow the Money Radio. Do you wanna learn how to trade options? Are you intimidated by options trading but still have a desire to learn how it all works? If so, you will be pleased to know that our options trading course is now on sale in our online store for only $37, but for a very limited time. When you purchase this five hour online video course, you will learn how to leverage the power of options to generate a steady stream of income from the markets 
while minimizing risk. This course, which is deeply discounted for a limited time, provides you with eight full-length video lessons with me that will walk you step-by-step -step on how to get started in the world of trading options. This video course begins with a comprehensive introduction to key options trading concepts, including calls and puts, premiums, volatility, along with an introduction to option Greeks and how to properly value an option before you make a trade. But this video course not only introduces you to the basic concepts of options trading, it also provides you with three proven option trading strategies, including how to rent out the stocks that you already own to others to generate a passive income by selling covered call options. We'll also teach you a smart way to buy call options for profits, and our students have told us that the secrets revealed in this video alone are worth the price of the entire options trading course. You'll also learn a unique options trading strategy where you can get paid while you wait to buy your favorite stock. This is an advanced trading strategy that is one of our favorites among our top trading students. So this options trading course contains a tremendous amount of knowledge jam-packed into five full hours of video presentations that you will want to watch over and over again as you begin or continue your trading journey. If your goal is to learn how to make money with options, this is a must-have education video series. And you can unlock this entire video course right now by simply going to followthemoney.com forward slash shop. There you'll find our online store and simply look for the options trading course. This is a special introductory price and it is a limited time offer. So act now. Go to followthemoney.com forward slash shop and take advantage of our deeply discounted options trading course today. All right, friends, welcome back to the podcast. We're in our final moments here. And I just want to say I really hope you enjoyed today's podcast all about options trading. Options trading is really a neat strategy. It's a wonderful tool to have in your tool bag as a trader and investor. And if you're not uh, comfortable with options, if you're still learning about options and you want to learn more, I strongly encourage you to check out our course, a five-hour course, eight video lessons, all taught by me step-by-step and it'll really help demystify this topic so that you can begin to profit from options trading. Again, you can find that course in our online store. Simply go to followthemoney.com forward slash shop. And as always, I'd like to leave you with a final word, this time a quote by Carl Sandburg. And he said, time is the coin of your life. It is the only coin you have, and only you can determine how it will be spent. Be careful lest you let other people spend it for you. And that's just something to think about. Remember, friends, when you want the truth about the global economy, just follow the money. Have a safe and prosperous week, and we'll see you right back here next time. Until then, God bless. information contained on the Follow the Money podcast is strictly for informational and educational purposes. It should not be construed as specific investment advice. The views and opinions of our guests and sponsors, including Tom Cloud, are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of FTMDaily.com or Robinson Media Group, LLC. Jerry Robinson does hold an insurance license and at times may offer consulting on life insurance and fixed retirement income products. Follow-up, individualized responses to email or phone requests that involve the rendering of personalized investment advice for compensation will not be made absent compliance with state investment advisor registration requirements or an applicable exemption or exclusion and applicable insurance regulations. Past performance is not indicative of future results. You should be aware of the real risk of loss in following any strategy or investment decision discussed on the podcast. Remember, never do your financial planning through podcast or radio. It's your money. Be wise. Do your due diligence and always consider